You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here in June of 2024 with episode 461 of The Corbett Report podcast, I read The Most Dangerous Superstition, and you can too. That's right, friends. As you know, if you are a regular listener to The Corbett Report, I have had a series of podcasts in the past in which I go through various books that I subjected myself to and I dissected them for the propaganda that they are in front of your very eyes. For example, episode 412 of The Corbett Report podcast, I read The Great Narrative, so you don't have to. Or episode 418, I read Bill Gates' new book, so you don't have to. Or episode 439, I read Richard Haas' new book, so you don't have to. Or episode 451, I read Yuval Noah Harari's new book, so you don't have to. But as I pointed out in those podcasts, I came to regret the the titles of those podcasts because... It makes it sound like I'm telling people not to read certain books. You don't have to read this or that book. No, you really should read whatever book you are interested in, including the propaganda books, because as I hope those episodes adequately demonstrate, it does actually benefit benefit us to know about what these schemers, Machiavellian schemers and would-be rulers and technocratic tyrants are actually talking about quite openly, quite openly discussing, if for nothing else, that we can then use that explicit black and white documented confession of these various sickos um, for the normies in our life who may or may not ever look at something like the Corbett Report, but may, oh, did you know that in this book, Yuval Noah Harari writes, blah, blah, blah. It's good to know about many things, including, as I have talked about in the past, listening to the enemy, listening to enemy propaganda, reading enemy propaganda. It is valuable. But... It did strike me at a certain point. You know, this is very much like Propaganda Watch. As you know, that was a series that I ran for, what, three years? That was, I think, quite valuable. And I like to think did a good job of deconstructing propaganda on a weekly basis, taking a look at this or that piece of propaganda, showing you how it functions, and thus disarming it. But... As you also know, after three years of doing that series, I did come to the point where I thought, you know, instead of focusing laser-like all of my attention, energy, devoting my life to deconstructing the propaganda, you know, maybe I should turn that attention and energy towards something productive like, oh, I don't know, Solutions Watch, so that we can look at the things that people are doing that will benefit us, that will make positive changes in the world, or at the very least, get us thinking in that direction, looking in that direction, paying our attention to those things so that we can then bring about, manifest a better world. That seems like perhaps a more productive use of my time. Well, in the similar way, why has every single one of these books that I've dissected in this uh, podcast series, why has it always been some propagandistic piece of trash that in the end I give zero out of ten uh, rating and tell you uh, you're, you, you're best to avoid. Why not actually concentrate on books you should be reading? Because there are books you should be reading and today's book is definitely one of those books that you should read. If for no other reason, maybe you will completely disagree with absolutely everything in the book, But once again, I think it does actually benefit you to know something in greater detail about the argument that is being made, especially because it is particularly my bugbear, maybe my cross to bear, as a a self-professed, self-confessed anarchist, voluntarist. Oh my god. I am sick to death of the stuck-on-stupid conversation that results every time the specter of anarchism is raised, And people raise the exact same questions, the exact same points, time after time after time. And the conversation never progresses beyond that. (laughs) And I'm convinced that is because people believe that when they hear these anarchistic ideas, they are the first person who has ever thought of this this or that objection. But what about this? (laughs) You know what? Actually, people have thought about that before. And in fact, they've written about it. 
And so I really, truly do think it would benefit you, even if you are not a, an anarchist, even if you are a statist, stuck in statist land, I still think it would be valuable for you to read some of these foundational works of the anarchist philosophy. And why not start with one that I've cited many times over the years that I truly do exhort you to read, because I think it is a valuable use of your time. It was one of the early works back in my personal discovery of this path of uh, political philosophy that certainly helped me to reorient my thinking and think about this subject in a new way. I recommend this book. So, in the interest of this podcast, I'm going to go through it in the same way that I dissected Bill Gates or Yuval Noah Harari or Richard Haas's or Bill Gates's book. We're going to look at a book that I actually recommend and think is val valuable and worthy of your attention. As always, I'll only be able to skim through it and give you a sense of the overview of what this book is about. It will be incumbent upon you whether or not to actually read the book. But when and if you do, I hope you like me, will disappear off screen as a voice that was clearly unprepared <laughs> with the actual physical copy of the real physical book. Yes, it does make a difference. Um, and I sincerely hope that if you're going to read this book, you will get purchase an actual copy, maybe an electronic copy, but hopefully an actual physical copy. And uh, my edition comes actually signed by Larkin himself. James, I look forward to the day when preaching the bleeding obvious is no longer necessary. <laughs> Thank you for that, Larkin. Uh, yes, I agree. And so I'm doing my part by helping to spread the word about this book. And you can too. So the link to the purchase the book will be available in the show notes for today's episode. So please do purchase the book. Having said that, unfortunately, as I did confirm with Larkin, the best way to purchase the book at this point is actually Amazon. And I am loath to link to Amazon, as you know. But it is the place where you can actually purchase the book and Larkin will actually receive the money. So at any rate, please buy the physical book. Or if you're going to buy an electronic copy, buy it that way. Um, for the purposes of today's podcast, however... I will be going through the book in an electronic format that is a poor OCR reading of this book that has all sorts of mistakes and things. I'm just doing it for ease of on-screen presentation for people who are watching the video version of this book. But honestly, the, the physical book is the way to go. And take it from me, writing a book is an incredibly time-consuming, labor-intensive process. So please reward the people who are actually doing that service to humanity. And that's what this book is. All right, so let's let's go in. Here it is, the opening, the cover and the opening page of the book, The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose from 2011. And it starts with a preparing the reader, which notes, what you read in this book will, in all likelihood, go directly against what you have been taught by your parents and your teachers, what you have been told by the churches, the media, and the government, and much of what you, your family, and your friends have always believed. Nonetheless, it is the truth, as you will see if you allow yourself to consider the issue objectively. Not only is it the truth, it also may be the most important truth you will ever hear. More and more people are discovering this truth, but to do so, it is necessary to look past many preconceived assumptions and deeply ingrained supersti superstitions to set aside one's lifelong indoctrination and to examine some new, some new ideas fairly and honestly. If you do this, you will experience a dramatic change in how you view the world. It will almost certainly feel uncomfortable at first, but in the long run, it will be well worth the effort. And then that goes on. And if enough people choose to see this truth and embrace it, not only will it drastically change the way people see the world, it will drastically change the world itself for the better. But if such a simple truth could change the world, wouldn't we all already know about it? And wouldn't we have, have put it into practice long ago? If humans were purely a race of thinking objective beings, yes. But history shows that most human beings would literally rather die than objectively reconsider the belief systems they were brought up in. 
the average man who reads in the newspaper about war, oppression, and injustice, will wonder why such pain and suffering exists, and will wish for it to end. However, if it's suggested to run to him, <laughs> case in point of the bad OCR of this electronic copy, if it is suggested to him that his own beliefs are contributing to the misery, he will almost certainly dismiss such a suggestion without a second thought and may even attack the one making the suggestion. So reader, if your beliefs and superstitions, many of which you did not choose for yourself but merely inherited as unquestioned hand-me-down beliefs, matter to you more than truth and justice, then please stop reading now and give this book to someone else. If, on the other hand, you are willing to question some of your long-held preconceived notions, if doing so might reduce the suffering of others, then read this book and then give it to someone else. Excellent. All right. So that's just prepare preparation. You are going to be challenged in your beliefs, almost certainly. So let's dive in. We're going to start with part one, the starting with the punchline, which really sets out the sort of the overall framework, the overall thesis for this book, which is elaborated in many, many, many different ways throughout the rest of the book. So if you truly understand and truly get this thesis in this section, then that's the book in a nutshell. The rest is mere details. Very, very, very few people will be able to just instantly get this, though. But let's start with starting with the punchline. I think this is incredibly important. This is the thesis in a nutshell. So let's turn to the audiobook reading by Patrick Smith of uh, disenthrall.me, the host of the Anarchist, etc. I'm sure anarchists in the audience will already know Patrick Smith. He did an audiobook reading of this book. So we're going to turn to that as a way of presenting this opening passage that really sets the, sets the stage for the rest of the entire book. Part 1. The Most Dangerous Superstition. Starting with the Punchline. How many millions have gazed upon the brutal horrors of history with its countless examples of man's inhumanity to man and wondered aloud how such things could happen? The truth is, most people wouldn't want to know how it happens because they themselves are religiously attached to the very belief that makes it possible. The vast majority of suffering and injustice in the world today and spanning back thousands of years can be directly attributed to a single idea. It is not greed or hatred or any of the other emotions or ideas that are usually blamed for the evils of society. Instead, most of the violence, theft, assault, and murder in the world is the result of a mere superstition, a belief which, though almost universally held, runs contrary to all evidence and reason. Though, of course, those who hold the belief do not see it that way. The punchline of this book is easy to express, albeit difficult for most people to accept or even to calmly and rationally contemplate. The belief in authority, which includes all belief in government, is irrational and self-contradictory. It is contrary to civilization and morality, and constitutes the most dangerous, destructive superstition that has ever existed. Rather than being a force for order and justice, the belief in authority is the arch-enemy of humanity. Of course, nearly everyone is raised to believe the exact opposite, that obedience to authority is a virtue, at least in most cases. That respecting and complying with the laws of government is what makes us civilized, and that disrespect for authority leads only to chaos and violence. In fact, people have been so thoroughly trained to associate obedience with being good that attacking the concept of authority will sound, to most people, like suggesting that there is no such thing as right and wrong. No need to abide by any standards of behavior, no need to have any morals at all. That is not what is being advocated here. Quite the opposite. Indeed, the reason the myth of authority needs to be demolished is precisely because there is such a thing as right and wrong. It does matter how people treat each other, and people should always strive to live moral lives. Despite the constant authoritarian propaganda claiming otherwise, having respect for authority and having respect for humanity are mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed. The reason to have no respect for the myth of authority is so that we can have respect for humanity and justice. All right, I'll allow you all a moment to collectively catch your breath, 
stop clutching your pearls, etc. Because I know that is quite a contentious statement that will shock and offend the sensibilities of the statists in the crowd. The belief in authority is the arch enemy of humanity. Isn't that overstating the case? Well, as Larkin goes on to explain in this section, uh, attacking the concept of authority will sound to most people like suggesting that there is no such thing as right and wrong. No need to abide by any standards of behavior. No need to have any morals at all. That is not what is being advocated here. Quite the opposite. Indeed, the reason the myth of authority needs to be demolished is precisely because there is such a thing as right and wrong. It does matter how people treat each other, and people always should strive to live moral lives. The reason to have no respect for the myth of authority is so that we can have we can have respect for humanity and justice. And in, to a certain extent, the rest of this book is an elaboration of some of those ideas. Um, but he does go on to say, I think this is particularly important, the reason it's so important that people understand this fact is that the primary danger posed by the myth of authority is to be found not in the minds of the controllers in government, but in the minds of those being controlled. One nasty individual who loves to dominate others is a trivial threat to humanity unless a lot of other people view such domination as legitimate because it is achieved via the laws of government. And he goes on to make the point, one person without this supposed divine right to rule can do very little by themselves, or relatively little. Um, but one person in charge of government can affect millions. Um, as he elaborates here, the problem is not that evil people believe in authority. The problem is that basically good people believe in authority and as a result end up advocating and even committing acts of aggression, injustice, and oppression, even murder. As he goes on to say, people falsely assume that many of the useful and legitimate things that benefit human society require the existence of government. It's good, for example, for people to organize for mutual defense, to work together to achieve common goals, to find ways to co cooperate and get along peacefully, to come up with agreements and plans that better allow human beings to exist and thrive in a mutually beneficial and nonviolent state of civilization. But that is not what government is. Despite the fact that government always claim to be acting on behalf of the people and the common good, the truth is that government, by its very nature, is always in direct opposition to the interests of mankind. Authority is not a noble idea that sometimes goes wrong, nor is it basic, a basically valid concept that is sometimes corrupted. From top to bottom, from start to finish, the very concept of authority itself is anti-human and horribly destructive. And then he goes on to an overview um, before he gets into the part one proper here, where he's just talking about the different parts of this book. So first, he's going to lay out the concept of authority, which will be distilled down to its most basic essence so it can be defined and examined objectively. In part two, it will be shown that the concept itself of authority is fatally flawed, that the underlying premise of all government is utterly incompatible inc with logic and morality. In fact, it will be shown that government is a purely religious belief, a faith-based acceptance of a superhuman mythological entity that has never existed and will never exist. Bold claim. So let's see how he does it. In part three, it will be shown why the belief in authority, including all belief in government, is horrendously dangerous and destructive. And finally, in part four, the reader will be given a glimpse into what life without the belief in authority could look like. All right. Now, if this is your first rodeo, if you've never read a tract of political philosophy right, uh, before, you might fall into the trap of taking that word, authority, that you know, I, I know what that word means, I use it all the time in my day-to-day -day life, and thinking that you know what that word means, and then applying it to every use of the word authority in this book. And you will note that <laughs> Larkin actually puts authority in quotation marks every single time he uses it in the entire book, which I don't know, I haven't counted, but it's hundreds, maybe thousands of times. It is always in quotation marks. And one of the reasons for that, not only because he's making the argument that it doesn't actually exist, but also, I think, to remind us that this is not being used in the everyday, day-to-day -day sense. No, in most political philosophy, you will find certain key core concepts like this that are defined in a specific way that may or may not comport with your everyday day-to-day -day use of that word in everyday language. So you have to know what the author means by that word authority. Does it mean that kind of authority or that kind of authority? Does it mean like this or that? And so that is precisely what he does right here at the beginning of the book in identifying the enemy. He defines this 
concept of authority. So let's look at his definition so that we know what it is that he is actually arguing. Arguing, He says, to assess the concept of authority and determine its worth, we must begin by clearly defining what it means and what it is. And then he talks about some of the con con conceptions that people have around that word. But he goes on to say, the distinguishing feature of authority is that it is thought to have the right to give and enforce commands. In the case of government, its commands are called laws, and disobeying them is called crime. Authority can be summed up as the right to rule. It is not merely the ability to forcibly control others, which to some extent nearly everyone possesses. It is the supposed moral right to forcibly control others. So every time you see that word or hear that word authority in the context of this book, you have to mentally understand, mentally insert that phrase if it's helpful to you. The right, the moral right to forcibly control others. That is what is meant by that term authority in this book. So please keep that in mind as we go through the elaboration of this thesis. It's extremely important that we understand what he's just saying. Because as I say, authority is used all the time in many different ways, in many different contexts. Oh, this person is an authority on that subject. They know a lot about that subject. They've studied it. They have experience. They know what they're talking about. That is not the authority that's being talked about. This employer has authority over his employee. That is not what is being talked about. What is being talked about is the, the imagined moral legitimacy, the moral right to rule, forcibly control another. All right, he uh, goes on to elaborate, it is essential to differentiate between a command being justified based upon the situation and being justified based upon who gave the command. Only the latter is the type of authority being addressed in this book, though the term is occasionally used in another sense which tends to muddle this distinction. When, for example, someone asserts that he had the authority to stop a mugger to get an old lady's purse back, or says he had the authority to chase trespassers off his property, he is not claiming to possess any special rights that others do not possess. He is simply saying that he believes that certain situations justify giving orders or using force. And he continues, in contrast, the concept of government is about certain people having some special right to rule. And that idea, the notion that some people, as a result of elections or other political rituals, for example, have the moral right to control others in situations where most people would not, is the concept being addressed here. All right, so now we start to get into it. Once we've got those definitions on the table, again, please read the entire book for the full elaboration of this thesis, but you'll get the highlights here and uh, dig in at your own leisure later. Okay, government does not exist, which <laughs> is not going to be the last shocking statement in here, but it's uh, it's one of the first. All right, what do you mean? Uh, he, he elaborates, in short, government does not exist. It never has and it never will. The way people speak of those in power, calling their commands laws, referring to disobedience to them as a crime and so on, implies the right of government to rule and a corresponding obligation on the part of its subjects to obey. Without the right to rule, which you will recall is what authority means in this book, there is no reason to call the entity government, and all of the politicians and their mercenaries become utterly indistinguishable from a giant organized crime syndicate, their laws no more valid than the threats of muggers and carjackers. So what are some of the ramifications of this? He goes on, all mainstream political discuss discussion, all debate about what should be legal and illegal, who should be put into power, what national policy should be, how government should handle various issues, all of it is utterly irrational and a complete waste of time, as it is all based upon the false premise that one person can have a, the right to rule another, that authority can even exist. The entire debate about how authority should be used and what government should do is exactly as useful as debating how Santa Claus should handle Christmas. But it is infinitely more dangerous. On the bright side, removing that danger, the biggest threat that humanity has ever faced, in fact, does not require changing the fundamental nature of man or converting all hatred to love or performing any other drastic alteration to the state of the universe. Instead, it requires only that people recognize and then let go of one particular superstition, one irrational lie that almost everyone has been taught to believe. 
in one sense, most of the world's problems could be solved overnight if everyone did something akin to giving up the belief in Santa Claus. Provocative stuff, I, I hope you can see, but interesting. So he goes on, all modern uh, discussion of societal problems is nothing but an argument about which type of magic pixie dust will save humanity <laughs> is a great line and one I should commit to memory. All right, so that's it. This is the superstition, this the belief that there are certain people who have the right, the moral legitimacy, the moral right to forcibly control others. Eliminate that and you eliminate the greatest threat to humanity. All right. So he talks about offshoots of the superstition, various things that, uh, uh, for example, law, legislation, these terms and how they're muddled and confused and what judges and legislation and courts mean, etc. How crime and lawmakers and countries and nations and other words are used to obscure what is really happening here. Uh, it talks about attempting to rationalize the irrational. He talks about the myth of the consent of the governed and other ways that people try to legitimize this. More mythology, not only the consent of the government, but the government works for us. The government represents us. He demolishes that argument, the idea that the, uh, the government is our servant and other things that are fed as platitudes, representative government, etc., um, that is used to um, justify this superstition in the minds of the public. Uh, the secret ingredient. This is an important one because it addresses one of those common stuck on stupid type of conversation stoppers that is thrown up every single time anarchism is raised. He talks about in their attempts to justify the existence of a ruling class, government, states, statists often describe perfectly reasonable, legitimate, useful things and then proclaim them to be government. They may argue, once people cooperate to form an organ organized system of mutual defense, that's government. Or they may claim, when people collectively decide the way things like roads and commerce and property rights will work in their town, that's government. Or they may say, when people pool their resources to do things collectively rather than each individual having to do everything for himself, that's government. None of those statements are true. Such assertions are intended to make government sound like a natural, legitimate, and useful part of human society. But all of them completely miss the fundamental nature of government. Government is not organization, cooperation, or mutual agreement. No, 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 no. And as he goes on to talk about, no, government it has a secret ingredient, something that differentiates itself from all types of mutual, uh, voluntary cooperation and, and various ideas for structures and that we can think of. Without the superstition of authority, no amount of cooperation or organization would ever become government. And that fact relates to another claim of statists, that doing away with government would simply result in violent gangs gaining power, which would in turn become a new government. But violent conquest does not naturally become government any more than peaceful cooperation does, unless the new gang is imagined to have the right to rule it will not be seen as government. Keep in mind, guys, this is not an explanation. This is a definition. So when we are talking about government in this context, at least in this book, this is what we are talking about. The secret ingredient, it's not just mutual cooperation. It's not some sort of agreement that people will do things in a certain way or that there will be certain punishments if you don't do it in that way. It is when that has the secret ingredient of authority, i.e. this illegitimate superstitious belief in the right, the moral right of some to forcibly control others. Eliminate that, and that is the elimination of government. All right, so as he goes on to say at the end of this passage, for something to be government, it must, by definition, do something that average people do not have the right to do. A government with the same rights as everyone else is not a government any more than the average man on the street is government. All right, okay, so now that we're getting these fundamental definitions out of the way, he goes through the excuse of necessity and writes, uh, a right to rule is not going to come into existence just because we supposedly need it in order to have a peaceful society. No one would argue that Santa Claus must be real because we need him in order for Christmas to work, which is a good way of putting it. So it, this is not a question of necessity. Oh, we need a government in order for society to function. Government doesn't exist. Authority doesn't exist. It is a superstition in your mind that you have been force-fed since childhood, since birth, and which unfortunately most people never even think to question. 
That is the point that is being made here. All right, he goes on in part two, the disproofs of authority. Talking about letting go of the myth, he writes, Accordingly, the point of this book is not that government should be abolished, but that government, a legitimate ruling class, does not and cannot exist, and that failure to recognize this fact has led to immeasurable suffering and injustice. That is the point of the book. All right. Um... He goes on to talk about why the myth is tempting, why do people like to believe in this myth of authority, uh, and he, he makes an important distinction here. The debate between state, statism and anarchism is often incorrectly assumed to be a question of whether people are inherently good and trustworthy and therefore need no controllers, or are inherently bad and untrustworthy and therefore need government to control them. In truth, whether human beings are all good, all bad, or something in between, the belief in authority is still an irrational superstition. But the most popular excuse for government, that people are bad and need to be controlled, inadvertently exposes the lunacy inherent in all statism. To wit, if human beings are so careless, stupid, and malicious that they cannot be trusted to do the right thing on their own, how would the situation be improved by taking a subset of those very same careless, stupid, and malicious human beings and giving them societal permission to forcibly control all the others? Why would anyone think that rearranging and reorganizing a group of dangerous beasts would make them civilized? The answer hints at the mythological nature of the belief in authority. It's not merely a different arrangement of human beings that authoritarians seek, but the involvement of some superhuman entity with rights that human beings do not have and with virtues that human beings do not have, which can be used to keep all the untrustworthy humans in line. All right. Uh, he goes on to talk about the religion of government, which should be familiar as a concept to those who saw my presentation at uh, Anarchopoco 2020 on the Church of the Holy State. If you haven't seen that, I suggest you check it out. I think it's worth your time and attention because it is not merely an analogy. It's not just merely a, oh, isn't that kind of a funny coincidence? There is something deeply true about the observation that statism really is a form of religion. And you can look at all of the different trappings of statism and its rituals, etc., and compare them quite fruitfully, I think, to various religious um, uh, accoutrements. And I did do that in my presentation. Um, but I think Larkin makes a great factor here, uh, gr sorry, a great point here, where he writes, the main factor distinguishing the belief in government from other religions today is that people actually believe in the god called the government, which is a, an astute observation. Yes, uh, most people in today's modern, developed, enlightened, secular society, oh, pff, god schmod, oh, what's that? But they do believe in government and in the authority of government, i.e. the legitimate moral right of some to forcibly control others. And that's an incredibly, profoundly deep, deeply held, deeply guarded belief. One would say the most deeply held, deeply regarded beliefs are your religious beliefs. There is at the absolute bottom layer of, of even linguistically, the way we refer to our most cherished beliefs is lexically indistinguishable from the way we talk about religion. And this is a point that's made by the Dark Enlightenment thinkers and others. Everyone worships something. It's just a question of what it is that they're worshipping, and whether they're even conscious of that fact. But one way you can find that is, as Larkin says, perhaps most telling is that if you suggest to the average person that maybe God does not exist, he will likely respond with less emotion and hostility than if you bring up the idea of life without government. Which seems telling, doesn't it? And I think there is something to that. Okay, uh, as he goes on to say, the belief in government does not make everyone agree, it only creates an opportunity to drastically escalate personal disagreements into large-scale wars and mass oppression. And this goes back to that earlier point that he was making. One evil person can do a very limited amount of damage unless that evil person is imagined to have the authority, the moral legitimacy to control others. In which case he can command a nation and start large-scale wars, mass oppression, the culling. And, well, you know... If you don't like it, you can you can vote again in four years, guys. All right. Um, as he goes on to talk about, authority does not equal immoral violence. Almost everyone agree agrees that sometimes physical force is justified and sometimes it is not. Though there is a large debatable gray area, it's generally accepted that aggressive force, 
the initiation of violence against another person is unjustified and immoral. This would include theft, assault, and murder, as well as more indirect forms of aggression, such as vandalism and fraud. On the other hand, using force in defense of the innocent is widely accepted as justified and moral, even noble. The legitimacy of such force is determined by the situation it is used in, not by who is using it. However, agents of authority are imagined to have the right to use force, not only in the situations where anyone would have such a right, but in other situations as well. It stands to reason that if everyone has the right to use inherently justified good force, and the law authorizes agents of government to use force in other situations as well, then the law is the attempt to legitimize bad force. In short, authority is permission to commit evil. So he does talk about this and elaborates on it at great length in the book, but he does make an important point. Once you accept this idea, this superstition of authority, it's the slippery slope where you don't have a principle to stand on in defense against tyranny. And he makes that point in this paragraph. The notion that man-made law can negate the usual rules of civilized behavior has some fairly terrifying ramifications if government is not limited by basic human morality, which the very concept of authority implies, by what standards or principle would government action be limited at all? If 30% taxation is valid, why would 100% taxation not be valid? If legal theft is legitimate and just, why couldn't legalized torture and murder be just legitimate and just? If some collective need requires society to have an institution that has an exemption from mor morality, why would there be any limits on what it can do? If exterminating an entire race or outlawing a religion or forcibly enslaving millions is deemed necessary for the common good, by what moral standards could anyone complain once they have accepted the premise of authority? All right, he goes on to talk about who gave them the right. In short, despite all of the complex rituals and convoluted rationalizations, all modern belief in government rests on the notion that mere mortals can, through certain political procedures, bestow upon some people various rights, which none of the people possess to begin with. So back in the day, it was divine right to rule. These days, no, you go to the ballot box and it's the holy political ritual. Um, but no political ritual can alter morality. No election can make an evil act into a good act. And then he goes on to talk about altering morality, the unavoidability of judging. And finally, we get into part three, the effects of the superstition. Now, this is a lengthy exposition on the psychological effects of this superstition of authority and government, and the way that it psychologically impacts those who are affected by it. So he goes through the various classes of people um, that this that we can examine the psychological effects of this on. So uh, he talks about effects of the myth, and then he gets into the effects of the myth on the masters, so the would-be rulers and lawmakers. And he notes that it's very unlikely that any politician would feel justified hiring armed thugs to invade his neighbor's home and drag his neighbor away and put him in a cage for the supposed sin of smoking marijuana, Yet many politicians have advocated exactly that via anti-drug legislation. They seem to feel no shame or guilt regarding the fact that their legislation has resulted in millions of nonviolent people being forcibly taken from their friends and families and made to live in a cage for years on end, sometimes for the rest of their lives. So the point is, yes, lawmakers start to... Lawmakers should be in quotation marks. Uh, start to accept and internalize this idea that they do have the right to forcibly control others and to use powers that other people in regular everyday situations would not have and can legitimize that. So they start to legitimize that in their own minds. And then there's the effect of the myth on the enforcers. Uh, millions upon millions of otherwise decent, civilized people spend day after day harassing, threatening, extorting, controlling, bullying, and otherwise oppressing others who have not harmed or threatened anyone. But because the actions of such law enforcers are deemed legal, and because they believe they are acting on behalf of authority, they imagine themselves to bear no responsibility for their actions. Okay, he goes on to talk about the Milgram experiments, which I have talked about at length before, but he gives a lot of uh, detail here, um, and what they teach us about the effect, 
the psychological effects on the enforcers. Uh, teaching blind obedience. He goes on to talk about the real purpose of schools to train children how to be obedient. Um, making monsters. There's a lengthy uh, treatise here on the Stanford prison experiments and what they teach us about psychological effects on the enforcers. Uh, demonizing the victim. So how uh, the people who resist authority must be bad to people. And by demonizing and ultimately dehumanizing those people, it makes it easier for the enforcers to commit immoral acts against those people. Uh, he talks about what the badge means. He talks about noble motives evil actions, noting that, yes, of those who become law enforcers and soldiers, most do so out of a desire to fight for justice, but because of their belief in authority, their noble intentions often end up being used to harm the innocent and protect the guilty, and he talks about that and elaborates with a lot of specific examples. Um, proudly committing evil, talks about, the, again, the, the psychology of people who become law enforcers. Um, but then, how about the effect of the myth of authority on the targets of that authority. Proud to be robbed. One of the most bizarre results of the belief in authority is that it causes the victims of government aggression to feel obligated to be victimized and causes them to feel bad if they avoid being victimized. Oh, I'm I'm a good taxpayer. I'm a I'm a productive member of society. You you see how quickly I kneel down and lick the boots of those in authority. Um, there is a big difference. He, he does go on to talk about uh, those people who are so proud. I, I you know, I pay my taxes. I, I help contribute something back to society. But he says there's a big difference between feeling good about having voluntarily supported some worthy cause and taking pride in being subjugated. Um, not to mention, of course, the specifics of the extortion. Um, that is taxation. Uh, proud to be controlled. If a slave can be convinced... You know what? Actually, this is an incredibly important passage. So let's turn back for a breather to the audiobook version of this, because I think it is important that we hear the elaboration of this argument. This is one of the most important psychological parts of the entire authority slash government superstition that Larkin is elaborating in this passage. Proud to be controlled. If a slave can be convinced that he should be a slave, that his enslavement is both proper and legitimate, that he is the rightful property of his master and that he has an obligation to produce as much as possible for his master, then he does not need to be physically oppressed. In other words, enslaving the mind makes enslaving the body unnecessary. And that is exactly what the belief in authority does. It teaches people that it is morally virtuous that they surrender their time, effort, and property, as well as their freedom and control over their own lives, to a ruling class. Many people express pride at being law-abiding taxpayers, which means only that they do what the politicians tell them to do and give the politicians money. When confronted with the idea that it is wrong for them to be forcibly deprived of the fruits of their labors, even if it is done legally, such people often vehemently defend those who continue to rob them, insisting that such robbery is essential to human civilization. Of course, they do not use the term robbery to describe the situation, though they are well aware of what would be done to them if they refuse to pay. Likewise, when one person objects to the level of taxation or other forcible control being inflicted upon him by those in government, Others who are also being oppressed will often condemn the one who is objecting, telling him that if he does not like how he is being treated, he should leave the country. Maligning a fellow victim of coercion for complaining about it is a sure sign that a person actually takes pride in his own enslavement. Frederick Douglass, a former slave, witnessed and described that exact phenomenon among his fellow slaves many of whom were proud of how hard they worked for their masters and how faithfully they did as they were told. From their perspective, a runaway slave was a shameful thief, having stolen himself from the master. Douglas described how thoroughly indoctrinated many slaves were, to the point where they truly believed that their own enslavement was just and righteous. Quote, I have found that, to make a contented slave, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and, as far as possible, to annihilate the power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be made to feel that slavery is right, 
and he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man. End quote. That is such a profoundly important point, a bedrock foundational point, that if nothing else, I hope that this will sink in. Namely, the observation that no one is more thoroughly enslaved than someone who believes himself to rightfully be a slave. What kind of meaningful resistance can you offer in that case? And if that sounds familiar to you, hey, wasn't that uh, Etchen de la Boite, uh, Politics of Obedience? Ding, 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 you've been paying attention. Good job. But all right, let's continue. We're, we're not even halfway through here. Um, all right, he goes on and elaborates on various things, but he does address the inevitable objection that, well, your tax dollars are used for some good things. And he says, even the people who imagine that their tax dollars are doing good by building roads, helping the poor, paying for police, and so on, would almost certainly not fund the government version of those services, at least not to the same degree, if they did not feel compelled by moral obligation and the threat of punishment to do so. And he makes the point that, you, well, what choice do you have? You're not picking a service here. You don't get to choose, oh, I like the way these people are doing it. Oh, they're doing it more efficiently. Oh, well, more of my dollars are actually going to poor people through this organization. No, the government comes and takes it and does what they will with it, whether you like it or not. All right, uh, he goes on to talk about digging their own graves, the effects on actual criminals. So what? how does this play into the psychology of actual criminals who will, who don't care about morality? Uh, he talks about the effect of the myth on spectators, people who see the violence of the state and so-called authority, the sin of non-resistance. Oh, he was resisting. He must be a bad person. Imagining legal evil to be good. Well, if, if it's a law, then I guess it's the right thing to do. He talks about the tendency of onlookers to blame the victims of authoritarian violence being incredibly strong. One who accepts the superstition of authority the idea that some individuals have the right to forcibly dominate others and that those others have a duty to comply will assume that if authority is using violence against a person, it must be justified and therefore the victim of such violence must have done something wrong. And I'm sure we have all seen examples of people doing exactly that with whatever contextless clip of whatever police brutality incident or what have you. I must have been resisting. Shouldn't have been resisting. All right, uh, going on, uh, the danger of inaction. Uh, yes, as Edmund Burke um, rightfully observed, the, the real danger is um, people doing nothing to resist evil. I'm butchering that quote. Anyway, the effect of the myth on the advocates of legalized aggression. While most people imagine themselves to be spectators when it comes to authoritarian oppression and injustice, in truth, nearly everyone is actually an advocate of government violence in one form or another. Anyone who votes regardless of the candidate, or even verbally support some policy or program of the government, is condoning the initiation of violence against his neighbors, even if he doesn't recognize it as such. This is because law is not about friendly suggestions or polite requests. Every so-called law enacted by politicians is a command backed by the threat of violence against those who do not obey. As George Washington put it, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Most people in their day-to-day -day lives are very reluctant to use threats of or physical force against their fellow man. Only a tiny fraction of the many personal disagreements that occur lead to violent conflicts. However, because of their belief in government, nearly everyone advocates widespread violence without even realizing it. And they feel no guilt about doing so because they perceive threats and coercion to be inherently legitimate when they are called law enforcement. All right, an important point that he does elaborate on, but let's uh, move on to charity through violence. Proponents of charity through violence, i.e., oh, we can do good work by extorting others and giving it to the needy. Um, proponents of such charity through violence imagine themselves to be virtuous and caring because of what the needy may receive while completely disassociating themselves from the threats, intimidation, harassment, forced seizures, and imprisonment which they know occur and which they know are essential to any welfare program, but some of that welfare may or may not go to some people in need, so it's virtuous. Um, and this leads to people, when in doubt, advocate violence, because that is the state of solution. That is what this superstition, this myth of authority leads to inevitably. Much of the time, people will even advocate a forcibly imposed authoritarian plan simply because they're not sure what would happen if they didn't or are not sure how something would be accomplished if people were left in freedom. 
For example, if someone has a hard time picturing how a completely private road system would function, he will usually advocate a government plan funded by coercion. If he's not sure how well free people could defend themselves against without a standing army, he will likely advocate an authoritarian military solution funded by coercive taxation. Those who believe in government advocate violence by default. All it takes is a little uncertainty and ignorance to cause the average person to advocate a coercive government plan for just about anything. This is not how people behave in their day-to-day -day lives. The average person doesn't go around initiating violence against everyone he meets because he, he's not sure that everyone he meets will otherwise behave properly and make the right decisions. But that is precisely what most statists do via government. They advocate the widespread, forcible control of millions of human beings simply because they're not entirely sure that people, if left in freedom, would spend their money the way they should, treat others the way they should, find peaceful, effective solutions to problems, etc. By way of the superstition of authority, statists can comfortably advocate the violent subjugation of their neighbors simply because they're not quite sure how their neighbors would otherwise behave. That's another important aspect of this that he gestures to and elaborates on in great detail in this book, which is the, the absolving you of your personal moral responsibility for any of this, because it's all the law, it's, it's government, it's authority. It's not me, I'm not advocating violence. All right, he talks about liberal cowardice. Oh, here we go. The liberal, for example, resents reality. He does not want a world in which, and of course, liberal is being used here in the modern political sense, not in the classical liberal sense. The liberal, for example, resents reality. He does not want a world in which suffering and injustice are possible, but instead of doing what he can as a human being, he wants a government to do it for him. He wants some magical entity to make sure that everyone, himself included, is fed, housed, and taken care of, no matter how lazy or irresponsible they are. But the liberal views the world as a continuation of the classroom where there's always an authority in charge and in control who will make sure that the good kids are rewarded and protected from the bad kids. Each child is told what to do and taken care of, and all that is asked of him is that he does as he's told. The leftist, really, uh, speaks of each person having a right to housing, food, health care, and other things, as if some giant tooth fairy is obliged to make such things magically appear for everyone. Meanwhile, in reality, if a hundred people were shipwrecked on an island, what would it even mean to say that everyone there has a right to food, or that everyone has a right to health care, or the right to a job, or the right to a living wage? If, for example, someone has a right to housing, and housing comes only from the knowledge, skills, and efforts of other people, it means that one person has the right to force another person to build a house, to build him a house. But... <laughs> But just to make everyone uncomfortable and to ensure that anti-statism is not about left or right, there's conservative cowardice too, because as much as political liberals want a giant mummy state to protect and take care of everyone, political conservatives want a giant daddy state doing the same thing. The right-wing delusion focuses less on motherly pam pampering and hand-holding and focuses more on fatherly protection and discipline. Conservatives want authority to be used to create a big, powerful protection machine and to firmly impose morality upon the population, which they imagine to be necessary for the survival of mankind. Um, conservative statism, just as much as the liberal version, guarantees perpetual strife and conflict because it seeks to override free will and individual judgment with the so-called morality of a ruling class whose first principle is forced conformity and sameness. Of course, violence cannot create virtue, even if sometimes it creates obedience. So all attempts by authority to coerce people into being moral and virtuous are doomed to fail and ultimately do nothing but increase the levels of violence and conflict in society. And one thing that both sides of the fake, phony, left-right paradigm can agree on is that, well, we do need government violence and force. We do need authority, the moral right to rule over millions, hundreds of millions of people in order to get things done. And because they all agree the trough of power should exist, the fight, the real violence, the real fight that takes place, even against, even between good people, is the fight for the control of that power. Because, my God, that power is everything, so we must fight to the death for it. Figuratively or literally. 
All right, as he goes on to talk about true tolerance, he says, uh, to have millions of people constantly fighting over the sword of authority, each hoping to forcibly impose his view of goodness upon everyone else, has been the direct cause of most of the violence and oppression in history. Though it may seem counterintuitive, this fact is historically indisputable. Most of the evil committed throughout history has come from attempts to use authority to accomplish good things. All right, um, big or small, left or right, the state is evil. <laughs> I love these headings. <laughs> They're very to the point. Okay, left and right po uh, politicians all engage in wealth redistri redistribution, warmongering, centralized control of commerce, and numerous coercive restrictions upon the behavior of their subjects. Uh, politicians can be bought only because the, the law, uh, they have the power to sell, and they have the power to sell only because people believe in government. He makes a lot of other good points here. Um, the effect of the myth on freedom advocates. Now, this is an incredibly important passage because it talks about, for people who do at least mouth platitudes about being interested in freedom and the way that they advocate for it, there are some profound implications for the fact that this belief in authority is a belief in a superstitious entity that does not exist, what does that mean in practical terms for people who are advocating against tyranny of various forms? And there are a lot of people who believe themselves to be fighting the non-existent mythical beast of government and in various ways. And there are people who will criticize this or that part of the ruling class because they're not ruling in the right way. But if they don't get to the underlying principle are they really advocating for freedom at all? And, well, let's see how Larkin expands on this. There is a fundamental difference between having complaints about a particular ruling class and recognizing and opposing the insanity of authority in principle. In short, in all the various societal manifestations of so-called rebelliousness and nonconformity, almost none have actually escaped the myth of authority. Instead, they have merely attempted to make a new authority, a new ruling class, a new government, a new centralized machine of coercion through which they could forcibly subjugate and control their neighbors. In short, nearly all so-called rebels are phonies who pretend to be resisting the man, but who really just want to be the man. And this should be expected. If one starts with the assumption that there should and must be an authority, and that a government exerting control over a population is a legitimate situation, why would anyone not want to be the one in charge? Each person, by definition, wants the world to be the way he thinks it should be. And what better way could any person accomplish that than by becoming king? If someone accepts the notion that authoritarian power is valid, why would he not want it to be used to try to create the world as he wants it to be? This is why the only people who truly advocate freedom in principle are anarchists and voluntarists, people who understand that forcibly dominating others is not legitimate, even when it is called law, and even when it is done in the name of the people or the common good. There's a big difference between striving for a new, wiser, nobler master and striving for a world of equals, where there are no masters and no slaves. Likewise, there's a big difference between a slave who believes in the principle of freedom and a slave whose ultimate goal is to become the new master. And this is true even if that slave truly intends to be a kind and generous master. Even those who advocate a relatively limited, benign type of government are advocating against freedom. As long as people believe in the myth of authority, every downfall of one tyrant will be followed by the creation and growth of a new tyrant. All right, I'm sure the quicker students in the audience are starting to really understand and internalize that the fundamental idea of this book and why authority, the belief in this most dangerous superstition, is really the ultimate or the arch threat to humanity. And what, in, what is involved in actually opposing that is not simply swapping out one master for another. It is to fundamentally get rid of that superstition, the belief that some have the right, the moral legitimacy to forcibly control others. All right, moving along. We got to keep things moving here. Um, he makes an important point under the heading, same as the old boss. Many have argued that society without rulers is impossible because the moment one government collapses or is overthrown, a new government will instantly spring up. In one sense, that is true. If the people continue to adhere to the myth of authority 
After any upheaval of a particular regime, they'll simply create a new set of masters to replace the old set. But the reason for this is neither the necessity of government nor the basic nature of man. What nearly all freedom fighters fail to realize, as they rail against tyranny and oppression, is that the underlying problem is never the particular people in power. Oh, if only Trump could save us. The underlying problem resides in the minds of the people being oppressed, including the minds of most freedom fighters. As long as the people accept the myth of authority, even open revolution will, in the long run, do nothing to reduce oppression. When one group of controllers and explorers falls, the people will simply set up another. All right, he uh, moves on to part four. So we've looked at the effects of the myth on various people. Uh, now let's look at life without the superstition. This is the solution side of it. And so he starts part four, appropriately enough, with a section entitled The Solution. Part four, life without the superstition. The Solution. Nearly everyone can see at least some problems with the government he lives under. Whether it be corruption, warmongering, socialist redistribution, police state intrusions, or other oppressions. And many are desperate to find a solution to such problems. So, they vote for this or that candidate, support this or that political movement or party, lobby for or against this or that legislation, and almost always end up disappointed with the results. They can easily identify and complain about various problems, but an actual solution always eludes them. The reason they are always disappointed is because the problem does not reside in the people called government. It resides in the minds of their victims. Tinkering with government cannot fix a problem that does not come from government. The dissatisfied voter fails to realize that it is his own view of reality, his own belief in authority, that is the root cause of most of society's problems. He believes that a ruling class is a natural, necessary, beneficial part of human society. And so all of his efforts focus on bickering over who should be in charge and on what the power of government should be used for. When he thinks of solutions, he thinks inside the box of statism. As a result, he is powerless from the beginning. Begging masters to be nice or asking for a new master never leads to freedom. Instead, such behaviors are clear indicators that the person is not even free inside his own mind, and a man whose mind is not free will never be free in body. People are so accustomed to engaging in the cult rituals collectively referred to as politics, voting, lobbying, petitioning, campaigning, etc., that any suggestion that they not bother participating in such pointless and impotent endeavors amounts in their eyes to suggesting that they do nothing. Because they view voting, whining, and begging as the entire spectrum of possibilities open to them when it comes to government, they are unable to even comprehend anything that might actually accomplish freedom. So when a voluntarist or anarchist explains both the problem and the way out of it, but without presenting a new candidate to vote for, a new political party to support, or some new movement or campaign to get behind, in other words, without proposing anything that coincides with the superstition of government and authority, the average status will complain that no solutions were offered. From their perspective, anyone who does not play the game of politics within the rules set down by the ruling class is, quote, doing nothing. They enthusiastically declare, you have to participate. They fail to realize that participating in the game created and controlled by tyrants is doing nothing. Nothing useful, at least. In truth, rather than some event needing to occur or some particular thing needing to be done, the real solution, the only solution to the problems involving government, comes from not doing certain things and from certain things not happening. In one sense, there is no positive, active solution to government. The ultimate solution is negative and passive. Stop advocating aggression against your neighbors. Stop engaging in rituals that condone the initiation of violence and reinforce the notion that some people have the right to rule. Stop thinking and speaking and acting in ways that reinforce the myth that normal people should be and must be beholden to some master and should obey such a master rather than follow their own consciences. When people stop bowing at the altar of government, 
Stop playing the games of tyrants. Stop respecting arbitrary rules written by megalomaniacs. The problem will go away on its own. Being a mythical entity, authority does not need to be overthrown or voted out or reformed. The people need only to stop imagining something that is not there and never was. All right, it's one of those solutions that comes from a proper understanding of the problem itself, the belief in the most dangerous superstition. And once people have truly understood and internalized that, they will understand what this solution actually is. As Larkin goes on to say, when people stop bowing at the altar of government, stop playing the games of tyrants, stop respecting arbitrary rules written by megalomaniacs, the problem will go away on its own. Being a mythical entity, authority does not need to be overthrown or voted out or reformed. The people only need to stop imagining something that is not there and never was. As he goes on to say, ultimately their bondage and the means to escape it exists entirely inside their own minds. Again, this should be ringing bells for people who remember Etienne de la Boétie and the politics of obedience. But moving on, let's, let's increase the pace here. We're getting towards the end, but we're not there yet. Uh, he talks about how reality is anarchy. It is what exists. And he says the purpose of this final chapter, part four here, is not merely to argue that society would be better, would work better without the fiction called government, but to introduce the reader to the ways in which people will perceive reality differently, think differently, behave differently, and interact differently, very differently indeed, once they give up the most dangerous superstition, the belief in authority. Anarchy, meaning an absence of government, is what is. It is what has always been and will always be. When people accept that truth and stop hallucinating a creature called authority, the moral legitimacy, the moral right of some to forcibly control others, they will stop behaving in the irrational and destructive manner they do now. Uh, as he goes on to say, most people do not even know how to mentally process the idea of a complete lack of any forcibly imposed system, so they will instinctively ask things such as, how would the roads work? Or how would we defend ourselves? And he goes on to elaborate on the response to that, but he ends up at this point, no one could predict and no one will control what all will happen in a world without the myth of government. The following is not, therefore, intended to be a complete explanation of how every piece of human society would work once the authority myth is gone. Instead, it is an introduction to a few of the ways in which human beings might stop allowing an irrational superstition to distort their thinking and pervert their behavior, and might start behaving as rational free beings, driven by their own free will and individual judgment, as they ought to be. All right, he talks about the fear of freedom and how that's weaponized by the statists. He talks about seeing a different world in which he notes, one who has been deprogrammed sees not only the futility in all political action, but sees that such actions, no matter what their intended goals, actually reinforce the superstition. The idea that there is a volcano god, so begging politicians for favors re, uh, actually reinforce the superstition, just as everyone in a tribe praying to a volcano god would reinforce the idea that there is a volcano god, so begging politicians for favors reinforces the idea that there is a rightful ruling class, that their commands are law, and that obedience to such laws is a moral imperative. He talks about a world without rules, really? Without the myth of authority, people would still have disagreements. And some would still be malicious or negligent and would still do stupid or hostile things. But if someone did not feel justified in doing something himself, he would not feel justified in asking someone else to do it, nor would he feel justified doing it himself on someone else's behalf. In a society without the myth of authority, there would still be thieves, murderers, and other aggressors. The difference is that all of the people who view theft and murder as immoral would not advocate and condone legal theft and murder, which every statist now does. All right, thinking differently, talking differently. This is an interesting section for, for me anyway. I, I'm interested in language and how it shapes our reality. So he gives some examples of how, well, if we got rid of the superstition uh, belief in authority, what would it look like? Well, with superstition, we might say, today the local government of Springfield put into place a 4% increase in local building permit fees, the proceeds of which are intended to fund a program to provide certain medical assistance for the elderly. 
but without the superstition of authority, that same, that exact same sentence would read, Today, a group of local extortionists issued a formal threat to anyone doing construction or renovation in Springfield, demanding 4% more than the group had previously demanded from such people. The thieves say they intend to give some of the money they seize to the elderly. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to teaching morality versus teaching authority. We talked about how school, public government schooling these days is about teaching obedience. So what would the opposite look like if instead children are taught the principle of self-ownership, the idea that every individual belongs to himself and there should not, therefore should not be robbed, threatened, assaulted, or murdered, then the supposed virtue of obedience is completely unnecessary. Consider which, consider which of the following is more likely to lead to a just, peaceful society. Billions of people being taught the basics of how to be moral human beings, for example, the principle of non-aggression, or billions of people being taught merely to obey in the hopes that the few people who end up in charge will happen to give good orders. All right, he talks about no master plan, and he says, almost without exception, a statist who ponders a stateless society will begin by asking how things will work without a ruling class. He does not ask this simply because he's curious about how roads, defense, trade, dispute resolution, and other things might function without government. He asks this because he has always been trained to view human existence inside the framework of some centralized, forcibly imposed master plan, and is literally incapable of thinking outside of that paradigm. And so he will ask how things will work under anarchy, and will refer to it as a system imagining it as a new type of master plan to be inflicted upon the masses. When, of course, it's the exact opposite, a complete lack of a centralized, forcibly imposed plan. The concept is so un unfamiliar that these statists do not even know how to process it, so they desperately try to fit the idea of anarchy, a stateless society, into the mold of a master plan. But the truth is, with or without the myth of authority, no one can guarantee justice or prosperity or predict everything that might occur, or know every problem that might arise, or how to solve them all. The difference is that those who believe in authority continue to pretend, despite constant, overwhelming evidence to the contrary, that an authoritarian system of control can guarantee safety, security, prosperity, fairness, and justice. Statists want the promise that some all-knowing, all-powerful entity will take care of them and protect them from all possible misfortune and from all of the bad people in the world. So how do you talk to people like this? Well, author's personal note here from Larkin. I have found that whenever the topic of a stateless society comes up in my discussions with statists, almost without fail, they begin asking questions in the passive voice. How will this get done? How will that get ha be handled? They speak as if, even when it comes to their own lives, they are little more than spectators, waiting to see what will happen. This is because for most, for many of their formative years, especially while in school, they were little more than spectators. The scripts of their lives were written by others. Their destiny was determined and decided by authority, not by themselves. So, in an effort to get them to escape that mindset, when they ask me something like, under anarchy, how will this be dealt with? I respond, how would you deal with it? When they ask, what would be done about this potential problem? I ask, what would you do about it? And they can usually come up with ideas off the top of their heads that are better than any authoritarian solution. The problem is not that they are incapable of being in charge of themselves, their future, and in fact, the future of the world. The problem is that it has just never occurred to them that they already are in charge of themselves, their futures, and the future of the world. Okay, um... He makes this point again. Uh, it is absurd to ex expect that a system of centralized control, wherein a handful of politicians with their limited understanding and experience come up with a master plan and then force it on everyone else, would work better than comparing and combining the knowledge, ingenuity, and expertise of hundreds of millions of individuals via, net via a network of mutually voluntary trade and cooperation. Uh, he talks about a different society. Um, talks, for example, about the protection of security in this society, a private militia, for example, formed for the purpose of defending a certain population against foreign invaders, which is not imagined by its members or anyone else to have any special authority whatsoever, will be guided by the personal conscience of each individual member. No one obligated to, per to follow orders uh, against their will and consent or to kill others against their better judgment. Organization without authority. For some reason, some people seem to think that anarchy, a society without a ruling class, equates to every man for himself, 
with every person having to grow his own food, build his own house, and so on. The implication of such a belief is that human cooperation and tr trade occur only because someone is in charge. Of course, this is not the case, and never has been. People trade and cooperate for mutual benefit, as can be seen in the many millions of businesses and transactions which already occur without any government involvement. And he goes on to talk, for example, about the provision of food. It's, it, there's no one with a gun to the farmer's head saying you must grow food in order for them to grow food. But no, there are incentives in place for them to provide to others so that they can get resources and goods so that they can provide for their family and they can trade and cooperate with others. I, the way I like to think of it, 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 there is no government over the English language. The, the, the government language police are going to come and force you to speak this way and to say this thing, and you must always be in line or else they'll come and get you. But s despite the fact that there is no such government entity, somehow, for some reason, humans evolved the ability to communicate with each other <laughs> and to speak the same language without some person forcing them to do so. I wonder how that works. What's spontaneous order? Anyway, back to Larkin. Defending against ag aggressors requires no special authority, no legislation, no law, and no law enforcers. Defensive force is inherently justified regardless of who does it and regardless of what any law says. And having a formal, organized means of providing such defensive force for a community also does not require government or law. Each individual has the right to defend himself or defend someone else. He may choose to hire someone else to provide defense services, either because he's physically unable to defend himself or just because he'd rather pay someone else to do it. And if a number of people choose to pay to have an organization of trained fighters with the weapons, vehicles, buildings, and other resources they need to defend an entire town, the people have that right as well. And then, of course, the inevitable... But that, that's all government is, response. And he talks about that um, and law enforcement, etc. All of the standard objections. Uh, these, this is an incredibly important section, but I, I will uh, trust that you can read this on your own. Um, deterrence and incentives, where he makes the point that deterrent is not, again, dependent on the myth of authority. Uh, anarchy in action. He talks about anti-authoritarian parenting, an incredibly important part of this whole puzzle. Um, halfway there, uh, he writes about the road to justice and the legal system, etc. Side effects of the myth of supersti the superstitious myth of belief in authority. What might have been, that's an incredibly important part. You know, imagine if we weren't under the thumb of some self-appointed would-be authority. What, what could humanity have achieved without that burdensome myth? Well, anyway... We can find out in reality going forward if we just get rid of the myth. Um, accepting reality. Statists often say, show me an example of where society without government has worked. And he answers that objection. And then finally, we get to the closing section here. Remember the punchline from the very, very, very beginning of this? Well, here's the punchline revisited. The punchline revisited. Contrary to what nearly everyone has been taught to believe, Government is not necessary for civilization. It is not conducive to civilization. It is, in fact, the antithesis of civilization. It is not cooperation or working together or voluntary interaction. It is not peaceful coexistence. It is coercion. It is force. It is violence. It is animalistic aggression cloaked by pseudo-religious, cult-like rituals which are designed to make it appear legitimate and righteous. It is brute thuggery disguised as consent and organization. It is the enslavement of mankind, the subjugation of free will and the destruction of morality masquerading as civilization and society. The problem is not just that authority can be used for evil. The problem is that at its most basic essence, it is evil. In everything it does, it defeats the free will of human beings, controlling them through coercion and fear. It supersedes and destroys moral consciences, replacing them with unthinking, blind obedience. It cannot be used for good any more than a bomb can be used to heal a body. It is always aggression always the enemy of peace, always the enemy of justice. The moment it ceases to be an attacker, it ceases to fit the definition of government. It is, by its very nature, a murderer and a thief, the enemy of mankind, a poison to humanity. As dominator and controller, ruler and oppressor, 
it can be nothing else. The alleged right to rule in any degree and in any form is the opposite of humanity. The initiation of violence is the opposite of harmonious coexistence. The desire for dominion is the opposite of love for mankind. Hiding the violence under layers of complex rituals and self-contradictory rationalizations and labeling brute thuggery as virtue and compassion does not change that fact. Claiming noble goals, saying that the violence is the will of the people, or that it is being committed for the common good or for the children, cannot change evil into good. Legalizing wrong does not make it right. One man forcibly subjugating another, no matter how it is described or how it is carried out, is uncivilized and immoral. The destruction it causes, the injustice it creates, the damage it does to every soul that it touches, perpetrators, victims, and spectators alike, cannot be undone by calling it law or by claiming that it was necessary. Evil, by any name, is still evil. The ultimate message here is very simple. All of recorded history screams it, yet very few have, until now, allowed themselves to hear it. That message is this. If you love death and destruction, oppression and suffering, injustice and violence, repression and torture, helplessness and despair, perpetual conflict and bloodshed, then teach your children to respect authority and teach them that obedience is a virtue. If, on the other hand, you value peaceful coexistence, compassion and cooperation, freedom and justice, then teach your children the principles of self-ownership. Teach them to respect the rights of every human being, and teach them to recognize and reject the belief in authority for what it is. The most irrational, self-contradictory, anti-human, evil, destructive, and dangerous superstition the world has ever known. Well, the choice is yours. And that is, in a nutshell, the most dangerous superstition by Larkin Rose. Now, I sincerely, truly, from the bottom of my heart, I hope that this encourages those who are interested in this subject, whether you agree or disagree with what has been presented here today, to read the book for yourself. So once again, the book will be linked up in the show notes. Please go and purchase a copy so that you can go and read it for yourself, engage with this material, and again, whatever conclusion you come to, at least be better informed about what has been written about this. And this is only the beginning of that conversation. In fact... <laughs> I might disappear off screen again <laughs> in the near future. Um, but having said that, here is my conundrum. Once again, I'm left, like with film literature in the New World Order, I'm left wondering, is this helpful or not helpful in terms of encouraging people to actually read the book? Or does this make people feel like they've read the book? Because, yeah, I read the most important passages. I get the gist. And if to the extent that it's the latter, then... I will have to rethink this podcast series and whether it is ultimately valuable in pursuing it any further. So I would be appreciative of feedback as to your own. Uh, the, the feedback I am specifically interested in is this made me read the book or this I, did not, I decided not to read the book. I would be interested in hearing about that. But having said that, here's uh, the final appeal that I would put out there to the audience, specifically those in the Corbett Report who have heard from Larkin Rose before. You've You've seen the interviews that I've conducted with Larkin and Amanda Rose. You have watched the full feature-length Jones Plantation film and the short video it was based on. You've seen the Tiny Dot and various other Larkin Rose presentations. Maybe you've attended Candles in the Dark. You know about therosechannel.com, which of course is Larkin and Amanda Rose's website where they have all sorts of resources and links, including to the Most Dangerous Superstition book and various video presentations. Uh, live presentations that he's given in the past, special events like Tiny Candles that is teaching people how to talk to others about anarchism and how to spread the ideas of freedom, etc. You know all about that, but have you read the book itself? And if not, this is your chance. This is a great opportunity to delve in and get a better handle on this material. Having said all of that, I think I'll leave this edition of the podcast here for today. But all I can say is for all the people who are 
still have those same questions. But how will the roads, how will defense work? How could it possibly be? I can only say, bring it on, because there are many, many, many more such book explorations that uh, we could do here in the future. But that will be it for today. Uh, thank you for your time and attention as always. Thank you for your support in making this work possible. And thank you for supporting Larkin and the other people who actually write these books. I think it's an important thing to do. On that note, take care. Talk to you later. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.